I have a question for you. What should we think about Israel today? And here to deal with that very complicated question, what should we think about Israel, is uh, the author of, of this book, What Should We Think About Israel? And uh, he is a Dr. Randall Price. And, and Randall, thanks for coming. We really enjoy uh, talking to you. Well, thank you, Gary. This is a beautiful set that God's gifted you here. And very pleased to get a chance to see what Prophecy Watchers is doing. Well, we're p pleased to have you here, and we are thankful every day to the Lord for having uh, opened this studio. And uh, we're opening it for one reason, and that's to bring people uh, into your living room. And you can actually hear them talk as though they were sitting right there. And Dr. Randall Price has so much to say about archaeology, uh, about eschatology, about the nation Israel, and so let's get right to it. What should we think about Israel, and and what uh, directed you when you were putting this together? Uh, you identify me as the author. I'm actually the editor because I got 18 of some of the best scholars. And they're all very much aware of the political, social, and biblical uh, questions about Israel. But I said, I'm going to give you the topics from you know why. Uh, do the Palestinians feel like there's no justice? Or mm -hmm. what is this question about occupation? Or what about uh, people who claim they're the chosen people? Or say they own the land? You know, what is the truth about this? How can we get the facts and not just listen to what the media says? Because as we know, there is such a thing as fake news. There are people who have their own agendas. Uh, they have their own belief system. It's not a biblical worldview. So I chose people who distinctly had a biblical worldview. So we're all on the same page, but from different worlds and from different backgrounds and different age groups as well, and said, address these questions. And they did. And a very, they, they put it down where anyone could understand it, and they did it within 3,000 words. So that, was the, uh, that uh, was the plan. And so this is a very usable, accessible book for those who will read it. And it was directed a lot to those who are in the younger generation. Mm -hmm. The younger demographic uh, has a totally misunderstanding of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the prophetic idea of Israel, mm -hmm. they've neglected it altogether. They, they just don't even think about that. Uh, it's not important to them. Uh, it really makes no difference to them. But they think of Israel almost as the social media has, has uh, informed them that it's uh, an occupied territory that it is uh, mainly a problem in this world. And all of the divisiveness and the Middle East conflict is due to these intransigent people who are not acting in character with the rest of society. Randall, uh, politics, problems, <clears throat> especially politics right now. Uh, it, it, we, uh, we are doing this program in the midst of a, uh, <laughs> what should we call it, a political maelstrom in the United States of America, punctuated by the trip of an American president uh, into uh, Israel's innermost political uh, areas. And, and it's, he's got, sort of got the world on edge as we're speaking. Like, what in the world is well, going to happen? First, as you know, almost every administration, even the United Nations, uh, agreed at some point to put the United States Embassy in Jerusalem to recognize its status as the capital of Israel. That doesn't mean in saying that that it would not be subject to discussion or negotiation with mm -hmm. the Palestinians, but to recognize what the Israelis say is in fact the case that the Supreme Court of Israel is there, that the government of Israel is there, that the parliament is there, everything is in Jerusalem. So that's a, a needed to be recognized on an official level. In doing that, as you say, it caused a political maelstrom. People uh, said you are uh, basically going to foment a, a war in the Middle East. Well, that didn't happen, and we know it doesn't usually right. happen. Uh, also, the Trump administration recognized the Golan Heights, 
Israel's sovereignty over that. Right. And, in fact, the West Bank, although that's been subject to their, uh, their plan for peace, and that's why the Israelis backed off from acting in terms of putting the West Bank under Israeli sovereignty. As they well, had. as we, and we've looked at this many times, but as you go back to the early years of the 20th century, when Israel was coming back into the land, uh, there were push, various kinds of pushing and shoving and, and dirty politics and, and wars of various kinds yeah. coming up through World War II. And we, we all know the story of Israeli statehood, but my point is I'd like to lay this out as a question to you. Uh, how do you see this pushing and shoving developing right now? Because uh, everybody's talking about this new peace process that's going on over there uh, that involves so many disparate nations. And of course, the Palestinians have been left out and they are not too happy about that. And we've got all this uh, churning going on. And all of us Christians who read Bible prophecy and live in a state of high expectancy to see the Lord return, uh, where are we in this? Well, let's start with the Palestinians because uh, they haven't entirely been left out. All of this ultimately is to orchestrate a plan to where they will get involved. Uh, you know, it was an opportunity for them with the Trump uh, peace plan. And as been often said, the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And they did uh, in this case as well. Uh, because what they want is nothing short of what they think Islam demands, and that is ultimately a Palestinian state replacing a Israeli state. Mm -hmm. And so what the Trump administration did was something very interesting to bypass that plan and simply go to other powers in the, in the uh, region that were certainly anti-Israel and pro-Palestinian, but had a vested interest in making peace and just bypass the Palestinians altogether, which people said couldn't be done, but they did. Mm. And so they had the United Arab Emirate and Bahrain to this point, maybe eventually Sudan and then maybe Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. which are on the waiting on the cuff to be involved. That, <clears throat> of course, would eventually pressure the Palestinians to take action. So ultimately what they want to do is they want to get Israel to concede Jerusalem in part to some type of Islamic control. Uh, Turkey is involved in it at the present time, along with Saudi Arabia. Um, just, I mean, certainly Iran is backing things with Hezbollah and others who have that as their goal. So we see that, and, and as we see within the city, and particularly with the government, a more polarizing factor. Jerusalem is ours. We'll do what we want to. This mm. is the eternal capital undivided capital for 3,000 years and will remain so forever, uh, you really don't see anything but a problem coming for the future unless there's some kind of a political compromise or negotiation with uh, a leader that is able to finally make peace but at, at, a, at a cost that the Israelis are willing to pay. And I think that will be the rebuilding of the temple. The other nations like uh, the UAE and Bahrain and maybe others that are going to join uh, still recognize the Palestinian plight. They're a little weary of it and they recognize there's no uh, progress being made. So they're anxious to join in and make a peace with Israel as Egypt did, as Jordan did, uh, in order to be able to say, look, uh, get with the program and if you do this, we'll support you uh, as fellow Muslims and you'll will be able to help pressure Israel to, to concede some things. So Israel's quite aware of that, but they'll take what they can get for now, because for now the normalization of these things makes it better for Israel all around. As you were talking, uh, I, 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 the words of the Lord were echoing through my head where he says, I will bring you back. You know, and the world got very, very excited when God brought Israel back. Yes. into the land. And, and I think really without admitting it, most of the people in the world are quite kind of watching Israel to see what's going to happen because they know about God's connection and His promises to the nation Israel. And, and this is very exciting. Yeah, I mean, when I wasn't a Christian, the Six Day War happened and I watched it on TV but I had enough 
I guess, understanding from culture that this was something very important. The Jewish people were yeah. part of at least the Bible, and this was going to mean something. And later when I became a Christian, I was able to connect the dots and say, yeah, it was a very important turning point in history. Uh, I think uh, the embassy in Jerusalem is a turning point in history. I think many other things uh, have been turning points. Uh, Jews, yes, have come back to the land. They've come back in unbelief. But that was also predicted that they would mm -hmm. come back in unbelief because it's in the land that ultimately they turn to the Lord in repentance and he comes to the land and delivers them and that's all in scripture. So you have to get to the land in that way. Uh, and there's certainly a remnant there, a believing element that is leaving a gospel account. So when the rapture of the church happens and there is a, say a vacuum of believers, God will raise up from Israel itself 144,000. And those will be the ones carrying the, the gospel to the world, but particularly to the Jewish people. So then we'll see an influx into the land of Israel of people who have faith fleeing these different lands where there's persecution of Jewish people to come to the one mm -hmm. safe haven. And it's not protecting them because they're believers, it's protecting them because they're Jews. And that's why the nation of Israel exists today. You uh, are, are faithful followers, and, and I'm glad you've gotten t sort of to meet uh, Dr. Randall Price because uh, he's a man with uh, immense experience in and around Israel archaeologically. Uh, he, he has done much study, historical study, academic study about Israel. He's actually got the, the dirt of Israel under his fingernails from archaeological digs. I, I cleaned them. You cleaned them? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> but the point is, that, and the reason I want you to listen to him is because we as Christians are excited about Israel. We don't want to overrun our headlights, and yet big things are happening, right? That's why we subtitled this book, Separating Fact from Fiction in the Middle East Conflict, because you can you get on the internet, you can see anything, you can hear anything. Everybody has an opinion. But where do we go for facts? Well, for all the authors of this book, uh, the facts come from Scripture because God spoke. What God said was truth. And we have to then measure all the things we hear by what we know is the unshakable standard. And that's His Word. Uh, for instance, I, I, Christians have supported Israel down through time because of the Bible. But I didn't, I wanted to write a chapter or have a chapter on why Christians support Israel. What's this all about? And I didn't turn to an Israeli or nor did I turn to an American or someone else. I turned to a Jordanian. I turned to someone who was raised and still lives in an Islamic country. But he's also the president of the Jordanian Evangelical Theological Seminary. So he has a biblical worldview. And I said, you know, from your biblical worldview, which counters everything that you live in every day, why should Christians support Israel? Mm -hmm. and, and this is going counter to his culture, counter to everything. And he gave that answer. And he had to explain that despite the, the Arab idea and everything else, God chose the Jewish people. He blessed the Jewish people. He sent the Messiah to the Jewish people. He gave the scriptures to the Jewish people. God's not finished with them. And so they become the center of things. And why is Israel important? Because God says it is. God isn't through with it. Everything that He's doing, He's doing to demonstrate Himself in that place and, and, and time so, and space. Yeah. yeah, and so what you'll get in this book, what you, should we think about Israel, is not a, a, a very narrow idea, but a broad picture uh, from people who maybe don't think exactly like Americans and and the people who who go to church here and are watching Bible prophecy, uh, some of the opinions expressed here are uh, opinions that might surprise you a little bit. Uh, in fact, I'm sure they will. Uh, but the book is called "What Should We Think About Israel?" Most of all, we should be thinking about Israel, right? Right. I, and I at the end say, why should we think more about Israel? Because we often think less. Uh, we're so yeah. concerned with our own problems. And yet when you look at the Bible, from the Bible is written with Israel at the center. Uh, all in the Old Testament, come to the New Testament, that's still the context for all that happened. And so while we think of Europe and the Americas and the West as so important, for, at least for the last 2,000 years, we've seen how God is turning the attention of the whole world back to the Middle East because that's where 
Well, it all ends. That's where it all wraps up. And if Christ is coming back there, you have to ask questions, why is he coming back there? Why does he come somewhere else? Why is it, what's so important about that place? And that's why we should think about Israel, because God thinks about Israel. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, my wife and I have been to Israel uh, once many years ago, and again, just uh, th- three or four years ago. I cannot express the feeling, but when you walk there, you just feel that you're walking in the place that great history took place. Uh, uh, On the Temple Mount, of course, uh, in in some of the, in and around some some of the ruins and uh, when you when you look across from the Temple Mount and and you see that that sort of a little peak over there with uh, with some evergreen trees and you think wow, did Jesus really walk over there? Well, yes he did. And there's there's something Unexplainable. I mean, yeah. As much as you try to explain uh, about Israel, you can't. Well, at least well, I don't know that I can do it. Well, that's it, that's true. I, I start tried to start all of our tours on the Mount of Olives, overlooking this whole uh, vast area. Right. And there's four thousand years of history right in front of you. You see where yeah. Abraham came up, and then came to Mount Moriah. You go all the way through. There's David's capital, and there's David's uh, city, and then there is the time of Solomon, and then there we have where the prophets predicted everything. Jeremiah stood on those steps right in front of us. Then we have Jesus coming. We have all of his ministry. We have, uh, and then you're standing at the very place where it tells us that in the last days it says his feet will stand again on the Mount of Olives uh, when he returns. And so everything is just within view of the whole panorama mm-hmm. of biblical history. And what for me, it, the, we read the Bible in black and white, but we don't see it in living color. I, you, you remember back in those days when the TV was only black and white, yeah. and all of a sudden someone had you know living color. Living color, and, I remember. And, and, and it was so excited <laughs> about that. Well, that's what the Holy Land can be for us, and Israel in particular. It, it takes all those things that we have thought about but never been able to crystallize in our mind, and now you're there. You're, you're seeing what they saw. You're walking, as you said, in the footsteps of Jesus himself. And it just adds a new dimension to people's faith. So I, for me, it's a very important part of the ministry. And I have to interject something here. Speaking of, uh, of a uh, kind of an emphasis on, on Jerusalem, uh, the last time we were there, it was lunchtime in Jerusalem. And the, the group we, we were with, a very small group, uh, went in search of a, a restaurant, and I, I was supposed to wait with a couple of people here, and somebody would come back and get me, and we would go to lunch. So I'm standing uh, in Jerusalem about midday, and Randall, I, can, I'll ne- I can't, I'll never get over the people coming past me from every nation on planet Earth. I mean, th- there was no nation that was left out. Everybody was there. <laughs> And I, it, it was rather shocking to me to see that. In other words, the word is out on Jerusalem, and people are coming, and they're expecting something. Uh, it, it was, you could see the looks on their faces. Well, it's good preparation because it tells us that in the last days all the nations of the earth will be gathered against yeah. Jerusalem for battle. And then it tells us in Isaiah 2, that was Zechariah 12, 2 and 14, 2, but now in Isaiah 2 it tells us that all of the nations will come to Israel to worship, and Jerusalem in particular. So, you know, I, I think instinctively people come because they want to see that touch point with their faith that they can't have any other place. And Jerusalem has always been the center of prayer. Three times a day, Orthodox Jews pray. One of the things that's part of their prayer, the Amidah, the daily prayer, is a benediction that says, may you speedily restore Jerusalem in our days, which mm-hmm. includes not only the restoration of people to the city and the city to God through rebuilding the temple, uh, but also the hope that Messiah will come and eventually set up his center of government there. Uh, We're a long way from that, it seems, and yet every day that uh, we live, we move one step closer because the Scripture says we're nearer now to the day of salvation than before. Well, I'd like to ask you one very specific question, and that is, 
of, of all the things that you've ever seen and done in Israel, and there have been probably hundreds of things that you've seen, what's the most exciting thing that you've ever seen or done over there? Well, rather than talk about one thing, let me just talk about everything together. Archaeology itself, to me, is exciting. It's exciting because people want a proof for the Scriptures. Uh, how do we know this happened? How do we know it's what they said? I mean, we weren't there. This is long time. Uh, can we trust the text? Archaeology is one means that shows us that there, the text is historical, uh, that what is said happened, that the people that were there were there. We find inscriptions. We find unearthing. And, and that's with only about 1% of the sites in Israel being excavated. Hmm. And, and we have that much evidence. And you, all you got to do is look on the Internet. You can find every month, every season, there's all kind of new archaeological finds and things all over the land that show, wow, we found this, we have this. Uh, that tells me that even with that small amount, it, it verifies or, or confirms the message of the text. And we should not doubt that. We should be very uh, glad that we have this as a means to show that this is true. Now it's true regardless of whether we have archaeology. But we live in a a land where our faith is founded on facts. Uh, we, we want that too. We don't just don't want to have faith in our faith, we want to have faith in real facts. And archaeology brings those hard facts from the ground. Very interesting. I'll never forget uh, seeing the Isaiah scroll for the first time. It's just in a public place where you can walk and, and actually look at a, an ancient scroll and just to see the letters that were written so long ago. and. And if you've even slightly studied Hebrew, uh, it, and, and you, you can kind of sound out the words there, and, and it, you talk about exciting. It's just amazing. I've had the privilege of working at Qumran for 10 years, uh, directing excavations at the site, but then now for the last four years looking in caves. And we found some of the first caves uh, since 1956 that actually had scroll jars in them. Uh, the scrolls were removed, I think, by those fleeing from the Romans in AD 68, mm -hmm. went down to Masada. But we did find one fragment of a scroll. We're still trying to see it. It's not visible to the naked eye, but we're working to reveal that. But we know that, I mean, our hands are the first hands to touch those jars in 2,000 years. And, and because they hid away these copies of God's Word, uh, it's left to us that wonderful testimony that, that the Bible is true. And Isaiah, I mean, we, the only copy of Isaiah we had before the, the mm -hmm. Isaiah scroll yeah. was written over a thousand years later. It was from the 10th century AD. This comes from 125 BC. So now if people thought, people interjected different words or changed things, now they can say that they did not. The scribes were faithful to give us an accurate picture of the scriptures. Let's pause for a moment and uh, I'd like to tell you how you can get uh, uh, this book, What Should You Think About Israel? And uh, it is a thought provoker. Uh, also, uh, it, we'll be uh, uh, telling you how you can get Randall's uh, book, Jerusalem, in prophecy, God's stage for the final dilemma. <clears throat> and we have a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, sets here of DVDs. And, and Randall is, uh, is speaking all, in one, the search for the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the other, uh, the Temple Mount and the Hoax of the Millennium. You may want to listen to that one for sure. And, uh, but we'll tell you how right now. The land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem are without a doubt very special places to God. If you're anything like me, I suspect you've entertained thoughts about what it would be like to be an archaeologist and be the one to find the Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves of Qumran or the Ark of the Covenant. We can all dream, right? Well, our guest today, Dr. Randall Price, has been in those caves and he's led dozens of tours and excavations all over Israel. He is one of the world's leading experts on the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Temple Mount, the city of Jerusalem, and Bible prophecy. Over the years, we've discovered that many people have a distorted view of Israel and the Jewish people. Anti-Semitism is on a rise all over the world, with cities like Paris and London leading the way. In America, most of our churches do not believe that Israel plays any role in future prophetic events. Replacement theology has replaced the Abrahamic Covenant in many Christian churches. 
This is why Randall's two books are so important. They'll give you a firm foundation to understand the land of Israel and the city the Bible calls the apple of God's eye. What Should We Think About Israel and Jerusalem and Prophecy are each available individually for your gift of $20 to Prophecy Watchers, with free shipping included anywhere in the USA. But let me show you how you can receive both of Randall's books as free bonuses. When you select the Jerusalem Archaeology Package, you'll receive a collection of 12 spectacular messages on DVD that were preached before a live audience. Messages on the search for Noah's Ark, the location of the Temple Mount, the Pharaoh of the Exodus, the plans to rebuild the Jewish Temple, and several recent discoveries that have archaeologists sending aerial drones all over Israel to discover new biblical landmarks. All 12 DVDs, plus Randall's two bonus books, are yours for your gift of $75 to support the work and mission of Prophecy Watchers. Just visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv or call us toll-free at the number you see on your screen. We definitely live in exciting times. The Bible tells us that in the last days, the stones will cry out, and we will see that happening all over Israel. Thanks for supporting God's work with your gift to Prophecy Watchers. We believe Jesus is coming soon, so we'll see you here, there, or in the air. Well, I'm sure you want to take advantage of that. And we have just a few minutes, Randall, to continue. Uh, you know, I'm excited. Uh, I've, I've been watching for years. I'm really excited about the fulfillment of Bible prophecy because of what's happening today. So many negative things that could, that could just spring out in, in, a, in a split second and change everything. Society is on the edge in Europe. It's society is on the edge in the United States of America, in South America. Everywhere you look, it seems like we're on the precipice. And we want to be watching for the Lord Jesus Christ, but we don't want to overrun our headlights. Uh, I'd like a, a few words from you on uh, how do you watch? Well, I certainly watch television and the social media and all of this just to see what's happening in the yeah. world. Because when I turn that on, I'm watching what God's doing. I don't listen to the news analysis or commentators. I look to see the, about the events. Because for me, the, the raw data, the research data is scriptures. God has already told us what He is going to do. Hey, sometimes it's the bigger outline. We need to fill in the details. But I'm expecting certain key things that we're all watching to become clearer as we see current events. Now, I don't interpret the Bible by current events, but I do take the current events seriously because I know that everything that happens is God at work. I wish we had more time to talk to Randall. Dr. Randall Price, and he uh, uh, edited this book, What Should We Think About Israel? And you really ought to solidify your thoughts about Israel. Randall, thanks for coming. Thank you, Gary. We do appreciate it. Always my pleasure. And we'll talk to you again, I'm sure. I'm Gary Stearman. Hey, you keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.